So Anna metabolites uh, have a you know really fascinating history at Dana Farber. They had found that the folate pathway was uh, important in cancer, and initially they had tried to treat with uh, uh, high doses of folic acid. Um, found that that did not work. Um, kept going with their their science and and actually discovered a, that actually blocking the folate folate pathway was was the way to go. And this led to a first metastatic cancer cure. So we had cancer cures before 1956, but a first metastatic cancer cure, 1956, with methotrexate. There are uh, 16 drugs in this class, and this talk will uh, be relatively heavy on, on tables. Um, it, a lot of these have a lot of a fair amount of similarities, and thus the, the table format. So. We have um, from 1953 onward, uh, even the mid 2000s, 2009 for paralotrexate, um, uh, FDA approvals, so methotrexate 1959. Um, you can see that these are used in both liquid and solid tumors. Um, so many of our curative regimens, for instance, in colon cancer or rectal cancer include uh, these agents. And then uh, many of the curative intent agents uh, for hematology, BMT, are, are listed here. There is a, you know, four of these agents really aren't used that much, so I won't be talking about, about those today. Um, and then, for instance, like, as an example, why things are, are heme, hematology-based, um, fludarabine, for, for example, is, is ionized, so it rarely leaves the blood and marrow space, so it's a really tight area of therapy uh, implication. Um, uh, so that, that's a reason why those drugs are not used in, in solid tumor settings. Um, you'll see a, a lot of the Cape cytobine in 5-FU patients are, can be the same, same patients getting both. Um, so those numbers are a little inflated there, but uh, it's still nice to see on the right-hand column uh, you know, how hundreds of patients are, are treated with these medications. And so this is a really, you know, you could do this talk where you have a slide on each of these four subclasses with how the drug works and, and such. But it's probably best to just think about it as uh, impact on catabolic enzymes within DNA or RNA, whether or not the drug is incorporated into DNA or RNA, and then what is the ultimate expression in um, in genomics and e even in uh, epigenetics in the case of the hypomethylene agents. Um, so some of these agents, that, you know, decidabine uh, only incorporates into DNA, whereas azacitidine will incorporate into both. That doesn't necessarily mean that one is more effective than the other, uh, but, but those, are the, those are the pathways. Um, DNA polymerase is often impacted uh, with an example for gemcitabine, gemcitabine will actually have two active metabolites. So one of them inhibits DNA polymerase, the other one inhibits uh, uh, ribonucleotide reductase. Um, so just to get a feel for how, how these drugs work, there's a lot of different points in the pathway that, that the drugs can uh, interfere with. And essentially, purine analogs, pyrimidine analogs, um, is, is the general uh, general concept here. Um, the antifolites do not incorporate into DNA. That's the only subclass that actually doesn't doesn't go into the um, genetic structure. Um, so our black box warning slides. So 15 black box warnings. Again, I'm only going to talk about 12 of the drugs that are commonly used at UW Health. Methotrexate has the most black box warnings of any medication that has been FDA approved. And we'll talk about it, uh, uh, you know, have several slides going over, over toxicity and management of that. Uh, kind of interesting to find that there's many drugs that don't have any black box warnings at all. Um, and then also that there's really not trends. So we'll see myelosuppression as a trend in, in this category of drugs. But other uh, um, trends are, are not not really there. Um, 
As far as medication error prevention goes, uh, Cape Cytamine has a black box warning with warfarin, um, so they had excessive amount of severe bleeds with that. And then uh, fludarabine has the black box with pentostatin, which really is never used anymore, so we don't really have to worry about that uh, black box warning. Warnings and precautions, uh, so 29 of these total. Uh, again, if it's a black box, it, uh, in the chart, it's a black box warning. Um, so neurological symptoms, uh, we have PML, press, uh, fever, uh, post um and cytarabine syndrome, which is pretty rare. It's, it's not common. Um, probably one out of 20 people end up with that. So it's kind of a fevers, uh, muscle aches, feeling fatigued, and people do really well if you do Tylenol or a low-dose dexamethasone, like, like four milligrams of dex with, with that. Um, pulmonary toxicity, we have, um, uh, again, cytarabine will have a sudden respiratory distress syndrome. Um, it comes on really fast. It, it's really rare. It'd probably say once every seven years we see that type of effect. Um, and it can be treated with appropriate supportive care. Um, cardiotoxicity, that Cape Cytobine and Fiba Hue would be kind of the notable ones. They have a pretty uh, broad array of cardiotoxicity, uh, myocarditis, um, um, ischemic injury. And so certainly if you have a patient with cardio uh, problems on their, um, as a uh, concomitant condition or comorbid condition, uh, be, be careful with Cape Cytobine and Fiba Hue. Liver toxicity, so eight of the 12 have liver toxicity noted, and that, that could be a trend. Um, GI toxicity, pancreatitis, uh, HUS um, is, is found for some of the drugs. So myelosuppression, 12 of 12, that's really a theme after, after hepatic. Um, Transfusion-associated GVHD, and these will be like hemolytic anemias after a after a blood transfusion for fludarabine or cladribine. Um, they're quite rare, but, but we have seen it here. Um, infection warning. Hepatitis B is, can be activated in gemcitabine, so we, um, if there's risk factors, we like to screen for that. Um, derm reaction, so hand-foot syndrome with 5 few and cape cytabine, and then photosensitivity with the purine analogs uh, come up. Um, and then a kind of a panoply of uh, uh, other, other things, radiation recall, injection site reactions. Um, secondary cancer is, is less than with alkylating agents and platinating agents, tumor lysis syndrome. And these drugs really don't promote tumor lysis syndrome per, per se. A lot of these medications listed are just used in cancers that are, are really high risk for tumor lysis. Okay. so. Uh, I kind of dive in on, on methotrexate's mechanism of action, uh, and then that'll be it for, for MOAs for the talk. Um, there's really two main effects here. So it's an inhibitor of dihydrofolate reductase, and then an inhibitor of thymidylate synthase. And both of these uh, are necessary downstream for synthesis of purines and pyrimidines. Uh, methotrexate has a thousandfold higher affinity for dihydrofolate reductase um, than uh, um, folate. And when we end up doing leucovorin rescue, there is uh, multiple mechanisms that leucovorin works. It'll work, it'll compete with methotrexate for entry into the cell. And then once in the cell, it will compete for uh, nuclear effects uh, with methotrexate as well. So methotrexate is, um, you know, uh, this, this quote really applies here. All drugs are poison. You know, it depends on the dosage. It's the largest dosing range of, of any chemotherapy we give from 5 milligrams weekly um, all the way up to uh, 12,000 milligrams per meter squared. And we'll usually top out at, at 20 grams of the dose. So the sarcoma, young, healthy kids, 20,000 20, grams will sometimes see. Um, we will see toxicity with non-oncology indications. Um, they'll be uh, admitted to the hospital with, 
you know, with on model suppression for, for low doses. So it is, is something to be aware of. And then uh, really like high dose methotrexate is defined as, as doses larger than 500 milligrams per meter squared. So once you have your patient that you're going to be treating with methotrexate, it's important to do an assessment of what the risk for delayed methotrexate clearance is. Delayed methotrexate clearance will lead to um, potentially to all the toxicity listed in the, in the black box warning. So um, skin toxicity, liver toxicity, kidney injury. Um, and so these uh, um, items uh, are associated with risk of delayed clearance. And this chart here is actually UW Health. It's uh, 300 administrations of methotrexate over a four year period. And you see this kind of uh, slight trend with age and you know, the 60 to 69 year olds probably um, have the highest risk of AKI because if they're over 70, we don't really treat them unless they're in immaculate health. And so the 60 to 69 window, is, you're gonna expect a 20% incidence of AKI. Um, and then the, the morbid obese, uh, I believe, yeah, we had, um, uh, 12 patients in this category that got multiple doses, um, uh, 30, uh, 36 doses total. And so if your um, BSA is greater than or equal to 2.4, your incidence of AKI is shown to be uh, 35%. And this is adults, there is actually a published paper in kids showing the same correlation that obesity in kids uh, leads to higher incidence of AKI. There's a whole bunch of drug-drug interactions um, uh, on the right-hand side, really four main mechanisms, like displacing, displacing methotrexate from protein binding sites, um, urine acids. So uh, I think I still remember one time going to a room and they had four Mountain Dews opened and drained in the, in the room and uh, that had led to uh, urine pH problems and, and clearance issues. Uh, the nurses are, you know, try to try their best to watch for acidic drinks and, and such, but um, it's another thing to be aware of. Uh, pig like protein transport, um, uh, renal excretion, and then proton pump inhibitors. We still don't know why uh, that's a problem. We do try to switch people to famotidine if if they're if they need uh, acid suppression therapy. So kind of a lot going on here in this chart. Um, the essential process, so universally fatal unless leukovorine rescue is administered. Um, I'm sorry, this, uh, um, there's a little typo here that we wait to start high dose methotrexate once the urine pH is greater than seven. So not greater than or equal to seven, but greater than seven. Um, the pre-admission, the patient's instructed to take a half teaspoon of of baking soda with a full glass of water four times the day before admission and then the morning of admission. And we have data that shows that if patients are able to do this, we have an effective urine pH above seven at a much higher percentage. And so they're able to start therapy uh, in a timely manner within four hours of, of fluids. Um, I believe it's a 20% increase in uh, starting patients on time by, by implementing that um, strategy. And so if patients forget it or don't uh, do it, it's not like we can't start methotrexate. It just, we, it may take longer. And so urine pH is checked, you know, roughly an hour before. Um, and then it, it is checked again at hour two, four, eight, sixteen, 16, and then every eight hours after that, um, a lot of, a lot of urine tests. We check this methotrexate level starting at 24 hours and make adjustments uh, in the leucovorin after that. Um, we, there's a pharmacist note at hour 24. Um, and then we, uh, yeah, we wait until clearance goes down to uh, less than 0.1 to discharge patients. Uh, we, if patients have renal injury, we can send them home with oral leucovorin and and baking soda again until they, they fully clear the methotrexate. But the trend has been, uh, and our clinical practice guidelines state that you can feel free to discharge people uh, at less than 0.01 uh, without those uh, 
items. And then this is for adults. For kids, it's based on the protocol that uh, uh, the treatment protocol. Some of the kids can go home with once the methotrexate level is less than 0 0.4, as long as they're stable. So they have a little bit higher threshold for going home. Leucovorin, so it bypasses dihydrofolate reductase. So uh, it skips the step that's inhibited, and that's why it's called a rescue. It does not increase clearance of methotrexate. Um, the bioavailability is an issue, so that's why you'll see uh, these drugs being IV so commonly. Um, so if the dose is higher than 25 milligrams, it can't be absorbed effectively. Um, then on the right-hand side is our clinical practice guideline uh, supportive care algorithm for adjustment of leucovorin and fluids. Um, a couple of caveats here is hypersteVAD will be um, a 24-hour infusion, and so there's different guidance for um, methotrexate if, if it's given over 24 hours versus less than eight hours. And you can read in, read in the chart there. Glucarpidase is a medication for, um, uh, to consider for methotrexate overexposure. And this is a, um, we've used this six times in the last five years. It's, it's quite rare to end up needing this as long as your supportive care is appropriate. Um, so as an example, it, it's not like we, I'm sorry, as an example, we give methotrexate, uh, high dose methotrexate 75 times a year. And so um, uh, use of glucarpidase is, is quite low. It, this is a recombinant enzyme from a bacterial system that degrades folic acid and methotrexate into inactive metabolites. So it, it, it's not selective. Um, it's a non-renal pathway to get rid of, of methotrexate. Um, the dose has been a moving target and PNT has improved, approved uh, to consider capping the dose at 2,000 units. Each vial of this medication is about $42,000. And so um, we've had really good luck as long as it's not a severe overexposure with using the 2,000 unit dose. Um, second and third doses just don't work because it's a bacterial product and there's really rapid L immunization to this medication. And so it's, it's another thing to consider if you're gonna give glucarpidase is, um, if it's on the edge, it might be better to wait to see uh, how leucoborne rescue and supportive care with fluids goes. To be eligible, you must have both impaired renal function um, and the requirements for the methotrexate level. So greater than 50 at 24 hours or greater than five at 42, et cetera. Um, and we, yeah, we really don't do it if it's less than one. Um, this medicine is not stocked, so we get it from Nashville. Um, it's always scary if it's in the winter when there could be flight delays and such. Um, it usually gets here within 12 hours. We do drop shipment. Um, and it, um, we, if the weather is super bad, we've been able to um, get it from Chicago, um, like borrow it from another facility, but. Uh, our standard process is flight from Nashville. Um, so a couple like, don't expect you to remember this at all, but um, there's not impact on intracellular methotrexate, so we still need glucovorin to be able to um, get get into the cell to work. Um, uh, we hold glucovorin for a while because glucarpidase can chew up glucovorin as well, and we start it um, at, uh, two hours after. And then the levels of methotrexate will be artificially high for at least 48 hours. And we've really seen up to 72 hours because the um, HPLC testing uh, picks up interference from the breakdown products of glucarbonate. So it looks uh, artificially elevated. Um, there is a liquid chromatography mass spectrometry test that we can send out to North Carolina if, if needed to make sure that our, our level is cleared, but we have only done that one time. And it's usually not needed. Okay, summarize anifolides, so methotrexate. Uh, pemetrexate is, is well, uh, 
pemetrexid is widely used in lung cancer, so it's a medicine you'll definitely be seeing. Um, supportive care is needed for that medication to minimize myelosuppression and GI toxicity, and also to minimize uh, dermatology reactions, as, as shown here. A uh, couple of points on purine al analogs. Um, 6-MP metabolism is pretty relatively clean. There's three enzymes that metabolize the product. Uh, xanthine oxidase, 6-MP is used for uh, ALL, and people are on this medication for months, if not years. So it's kind of important to really educate the patient on uh, drug interactions and changes in their medications. Uh, with the xanthine oxidase, uh, we really try to avoid allopurinol at all costs. The 75% dose reduction is hard to pull off um, in practice, and so we, we try to avoid that. That said, you, you can do it if you have to. And then HGPRT, uh, like the cells will sometimes um, have less of this enzyme, and because of that, the exposure to the active drug will be less. And so it's a, that's a, a tumor mechanism to promote drug resistance. Um, it's not super common, but it, it is it has been shown. Then our kind of our main interaction is TPMT, and this is uh, available to order in HealthLink. It's not a special send out lab. You can order it. It's actually part of our many of our treatment plans for ALL. It's actually built into the treatment plan. Um, so come back. It's actually a um, enzyme assay. It's not a genetic test. Um, it is a it is sent to Europe in, in Salt Lake City. But um, yeah, it takes about two to five days to come back. And yeah, they actually are looking at phenotype of, of uh, the enzyme versus a genomic test. Uh, the results will come back with, there's actually two levels of intermediate metabolizer and then poor metabolizer. And so common dose is 75 milligrams per meter squared and will reduce uh, down um, to, you know, we usually start with half for intermediate, so 37.5 mg per meter squared. And then for the poor uh, hematocytes, we'll usually do 10 on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 10 mg per meter squared, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. It's very rare. I've only seen one uh, poor metabolizer um, in, in 14 years here. But that said, it's uh, super common. And at the bottom there is the lollipop diagram showing the um, uh, mutations of, of the gene, it's, uh, you can tell it's not an easy target to test for. There's, there's a wide variety of missense, uh, frame shift, and stop gain mutations, um, thus the phenotypic uh, assay is, is still used. Um, we won't talk about it here, but uh, the NUDT15 mutations or uh, NUDIX mutations um, are also tested for, and that is actually a send out. So we're trying to trying to incorporate that into Beacon as something that's pre-built because um, it's just as important to test for, and it, it follows a similar process as TPMT with uh, intermediate metabolism for metabolism. Uh, cladribine and fludarabine, just a couple of comments. Um, cladribine can be given sub-Q, um, and unfortunately, this can require, like, our sub-Q doses have to be less than two milliliters, and it can require up to seven injections, depending on uh, patient's weight. Um, so it's something important to, to talk to the patient about. Um, the, uh, like, we were really, really worry about overdoses in both cladribine and fludarabine, and it's been kind of interesting to talk to patient, or, to physicians that were around during these trials. Um, Dr. Longo actually, who's moved on to Freighter, but he led a clutter bean trial here and they uh, had to admit people for 28 days and they, they saw pretty profound neurotoxicity effects with the higher doses. Um, and so we have uh, avoid overdose with this medication. It, it really can be serious and irreversible. Uh, Fludarabine, um, also has severe toxicity, uh, blindness coma. Um, and that can come up with renal clearance. So patients 
like the active metabolite is decreased in renal impairment, and most physicians will be pretty conservative with reducing the dose uh, if needed, uh, if, if any concern at all of, of renal toxicity. And the kind of, you know, it's a pretty good myelosuppressive drug, so it's pretty good bone marrow and CAR-T drug, so it's, you probably don't need the, the highest dose as long as you're going on to consolidate with some other therapy. Um, and fludarabine, more commonly in our old FCR regimens for CLL, uh, infections would pop up um, months after being given because T cell depletion with fludarabine is six months plus. So that's another thing to, to watch for. There is oral cladribine. It's not used for cancer. It's um, actually not really used much anymore. They, there is an MS indication. Um, oral cladribine is associated with uh, secondary cancers, so um, it's not used for cancer patients. Like if you have active cancer, you uh, are excluded from using oral cladribine. Okay, moving on to our third subclass, uh, some hints. Um, um, so 5 fu and capecitabine can be, you know, capecitabine is a prodrug of 5 fu um, and foot syndrome uh, is, is common. And so there's a really nice health facts for you sheet. It really talks about stuff that patients don't really think about um, that may, may impact their, their feet and skin. So, you know, working with a chainsaw, we can, um, using the drill, um, playing tennis, um, gardening uh, uh, are all things that could make the hand foot syndrome worse on these therapies. Um, so something to kind of hold off on while you're being treated. Um, NSAIDs work pretty well. There's, you know, there's like utter cream is a, a recommendation that's given often in clinic. Um, if this gets too pronounced, um, the therapy will be held for a period of time until the uh, adverse effect goes down to, uh, you know, clears up entirely or goes down to at least a grade one. Um, generally, this is not something that lasts long term, so you can tell patients that it will get better. Mucositis, uh, here's a handout from MASIC, which is the Multinational Association of Supportive Care and Cancer. It has a lot of nice patient-focused documents. Um, here they're talking about bolus uh, 5-FU and um, uh, mucositis, and so uh, ice chips, uh, popsicles, if, if you are getting the bolus product. Um, some doctors will omit the boluses, so in an attempt to uh, uh, minimize the side effect for patients that are particularly fragile. Um, and doxepin um, mouthwash is a, another thing that can be used to, to relieve pain. We do not recommend sulprophate. It doesn't, um, uh, doesn't really have uh, evidence. Another uh, genomic picture piece here, uh, DPROID, um, so dihydropyridine dehydrogenase is a catabolic enzyme for um, uh, uracil and thymidine catabolism, so uh, pyrimidine catabolism. And this enzyme also metabolizes 5-FU and cytidine. Uh, deficiency occurs in three to six percent of, of patients, and on the diagram there, you can see how with deficiency, uh, 5-FU is not uh, metabolized into an inactive product, and so there's there's more active active product to inhibit methylate synthetase, and which leads to severe toxicity, and so um, cytopenias, mucositis, diarrhea. Still in NCCN, um, the guidance is it's, it's not necessarily recommended for routine testing. Um, these cancers are quite common. It would, it would add a fair amount of cost to the health population. Um, we certainly test it if a patient were to develop severe symptoms. Um, and it, uh, so if, if somebody's hospitalized for diarrhea, we definitely consider testing it. Um, David Yang, you know, pathology people might call you just to make sure the test is, is needed because it's about it's over $2,000. Um, I had actually just talked to him a couple months ago, and again, that was, was about two grand. Um, so it, uh, other tests are, are not as expensive as this. So 
part of the reason we we don't do this still is cost, and potentially down the road there'll be there'll be a cheaper testing uh, capability. Um, kind of wanted to call out the you know, package in for for Cape Cytidine. So this is relatively common in antimetabolite drugs to have um, dose modifications listed by adverse effect. And so if you develop impairment during the course of therapy, um, there's recommendations to reduce the doses. Um, infusional F5FU and Cape Cytidine has a different profile of adverse effects than bolus F5FU. And I've seen, a, you know, there is a fair amount of um, variation in practice style. Um, like some people will, some, usually not at UW, but I've seen more at, at community sites, uh, diarrhea without any attempt at control with uh, antidiarrheal medications like loperamide or lamotil, and the physicians go ahead with a dose decrease. Um, Usually we don't see that here, and it, in general, you want to try to manage the, the adverse effects with supportive care before doing dose adjustments. Um, that said, hand foot syndrome, stomatitis, diarrhea, uh, all three of those can be dose limiting, even with appropriate supportive care therapy. And if these come up and you end up reducing the dose to 75% of, of the uh, initial dose, you generally don't go back up to 100%, like you generally stick with that reduced dose. Um, but it's kind of interesting how um, kind of broad and nonspecific this guidance is in the, in the package insert. And so it does take some style points to, to learn how to actually use this, and then you will notice that your colleagues may interpret it differently than, than others. Uh, Another antidote, and um, uh, so unfortunately with these pumps, and I, I still can't believe this happens, but in, in 2021, pumps occasionally will uh, result in overdoses of, of 5-FU and medication given, given over a short period of time. Um, one, like, it's been reported that people will take, uh, try to overdose on Cape Cytidine. Um, there's certainly case reports published on, on that where somebody takes a whole bottle at once. Um, hasn't happened here as far as I know. But um, so in the last five years, we've had two patients needing this antidote. Both were related to pump failures. Um, and this medication uh, essentially, so the active metabolite of 5-FU is uh, fluoridine triphosphate. So this medication is uh, um, competing with that in uh, hematopoietic progenitor cells and GI mucosal cells to reduce toxicity. That's essentially how it works. And um, it actually works very well. Both There's two separate studies on this. And one of the studies, 96% of the patients survived. The other study, 100% of the patients survived. This medicine is also not stocked. Um, it's roughly $80,000 a course. So pharmacy, um, as soon as we order it, we expect delivery again within 12 hours. And our supplier of this keeps changing. Um, so there is a, um, it, a real recommendation is probably just to reach out to pharmacy to make sure we have, have the right supplier and provider and, and get the order moving as, uh, as soon as possible. Um, this is given every six hours for 20 doses, and as you remember, like bolus 5-FU is myelosuppression is a you know a major toxicity of the bolus dosing, and so we usually consider GCSF as supportive care and start that 24 hours after the toxic toxic dose was given. Again, two uses in in five years, uh, we give this uh, 300. Uh, well, with kids said it being, you know, uh, 800 times a year. So it's, it is pretty rare to need this antidote, but it is available. A um, couple of pointers on the pyrimidine analogs. Uh, so um, leucovorin with 5-FU is actually given to enhance the cytotoxic effect. And so leucovorin stabilizes 5-FU and thymolidate synthetase um, as a, a, a a structure, so that's why the, the inhibition is stronger with leucovorin. 
inhibition of amyloid synthesis. Um, as we talked about, adverse effects differ for bolus versus controlled. There's also a drug interaction with warfarin, and then serious errors with the ambulatory pumps have occurred. Um, hopefully, the technology on those pumps keeps getting better. We used to have balloon pumps that that were not electronic at all, um, and those at, in those times we had had more toxicity or more uh, medication errors where the drug was given over a shorter period of time. Cape cytobine, um, remember. You know, diarrhea is a big deal here, so make sure you remember your supportive care. Um, it is not necessarily in the treatment plan, so patients will call in for this and need, need supportive care. Um, twice daily, 30 minutes after food. And so terabine, um, rashes will happen, you know, roughly five to 14 days after. And often these patients are on other medications that also cause rash. So cefepime or posetanozole, you gotta be really careful with that. Um, neurotoxicity with high-dose cytarabine, which is greater than one, one gram per meter squared, um, uh, happens more with more like, cumulative doses of cytarabine if prior CNS disease or if renal impairment. So people with renal impairment, we almost always dose reduce the drug. And then for these high dose drug, uh, high dose administrations, we need steroid eye drops to prevent conjunctivitis. That's because the uh, drug is excreted in tears, so it directly excreted onto the eye. Um, gemcitabine, good to know that uh, like prolonged um, infusions result in more frequent uh, toxicities. And we've we actually had this happen where a, a pancreatic cancer patient didn't have a good peripheral, the nurse decided to slow down the infusion and give it over 90 minutes. And the patient ended up with grade four uh, neutropenia and, and neutropenic fever had to be admitted to the hospital. Um, so um, that's a good, a good example of how administration time matters. Um, these flu-like symptoms can happen and um, they respond really good to low dose steroid and Tylenol. Um, if, if needed. So this is weekly dosing and we'll just add Tylenol and I've even seen as little as one milligram of dexamethasone, but usually it's four to eight milligrams before the dose. And then not recommended with uh, radiation. And last subclass, uh, last slide of the class here, azacitidine, oh, sorry, there's one more. <laughs> azacitidine has um, impairment level dosing for Myelodysplastic syndrome, uh, it's sometimes hard to remember if they're not having response after two cycles to consider going up to 100. Um, and as long as uh, toxicity is not occurring, um, every day the nurses will rotate sub Q sites to try to minimize injection site reactions. And there is guidance on bicarb level or if you develop renal impairment. And same for decidabine. If you, over the first cycle, renal impairment happens. Uh, there's guidance on what to do for the next cycle. Usually it's delay until the toxicity resolves. The cytobine adds in hepatic impairment, so if, if that happens, delay the next cycle until toxicity resolves. And this is probably 5 to 10 percent of patients. Um, azacitidine, bicarb, and renal, and then the cytobine, renal, and hepatic. There is oral acetazine, and um, please uh, do not change the doses because they're, they're different, different doses for each product. And here's the last slide. I just kind of wanted to summarize renal hepatic dosing. And as I mentioned before, adverse effect dose mods um, are quite common within package inserts. Um, and drug drug interactions are, are listed. Uh, many of the medications actually don't have to worry about drug drug interactions for uh, antimetabolites. And then if there's any genomic considerations, they're listed. If they have a star, there's usually uh, controversial evidence um, around around the gene, so we don't test these up front, and we'll sometimes consider them. We have sent uh, MTHFR for methotrexate toxicity patients occasionally, but it doesn't really guide your next therapy per se. Um, uh, although, if if they do have a mutation um, in methylene uh, tetrahydrofolate reductase. Um, certainly, it kind of 
helps you to decide, well, they had really bad toxicity with methotrexate, plus they have this mutation, we should probably look for a different treatment option. All right. Well, thank you.